Right, uh, next uh, we're going to be able to uh, look into how the right to education, the right to participation and the right to assembly actually materialize. And this comes together in, in SNRE, the Spanish network of schools towards sustainability. And this is why we have here Jose Manu Gutierrez Bastida, professor, university specialist in environmental education at UNED, a master's course in environmental education at the Institute for Ecological Research, special mention in the first Francesc Javier Gil Award given by the University of Barcelona. He's been working in different schools and, and, and high schools. He spent 11 years at the Pedernales School Experimentation Center, eight as a pedagogical director, and currently he participates in Inguruguela, the Environmental Education Service of the Basque Government, developing training, advice, and research for teachers. He's uh, developed more than 50 publications, or articles, papers, reports, books, etc., on constructivism, evaluation, self-regulation of learning, and eco-social education. We have the pleasure of having him a few months in April in our fair, which we held in within the framework of the Festival of Human Rights. So, Jose Manu, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be back. Thanks a lot. I would like to uh, thank you for your invitation, for having me here to tell a story. Well, SNRED is a school network towards the edu education in justice and sustainability. The previous speakers, uh, both Carlos and Luis, um, have paved the way for me to tell you about all, everything we do. And you're going to see that later on. This is where I come from, from Inguruguela, which is a service or a... Uh, uh, a network of uh, equipment in uh, education uh, and research centers. Uh, who thought about this? Well, back in the 80s, someone thought, well, in order to uh, provide environmental education, why don't we put together the environment and uh, education uh, departments at the Basque government? And this is where we came up with this Inguruguela project back in 1989. So. Uh, and then uh, they thought, okay, what it would be the objective of uh, Inguruguela? Well, first of all, uh, it will research, carry out research on uh, environmental education. It will also provide uh, teachers with training. This is a non-university training system. And we also provide uh, support to these uh, educational centers. There, We also have some... Uh, document centers where uh, there are a number of different resources on environmental education. We also implement uh, the different campaigns developed by the bus government and related to the environment and we also have awareness raising campaigns of course. Most of our time is devoted to developing agenda uh, 21, that's what it's been called so far. Uh, now we are developing uh, Agenda 2030, of course, uh, coming from the UN with all the SDGs, etc., etc. So we're updating um, this agenda. Uh, there are 450 schools working on this uh, in the Basque Autonomous Community, representing 65% of all educational centers. Fine. Um, the schools that have been working on this for more than five years and already have an experience can uh, 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 decide to uh, apply for uh, to be recognized as a sustainable school. Um, for that, they need to carry out a self-assessment process and then an external audit. And uh, finally, they get this recognition uh, and uh, the Basque president uh, presents the award. There are 110 schools that have uh, received this uh, certification that needs to be uh, updated every four years. So together with them, we have created what you see there, the IDAES 21 uh, network. And this network 
is um, the network that participates in SNRED, which is a network of networks covering the whole of the Spanish territory. There are 15 networks currently covering 4,200 uh, schools, more than 1,700,000 students, and more than 100,000 uh, teachers. So all of them participate in this network, in the network SNRED. This network is also a member of a broader European network made up by uh, European schools working for sustainability. And we work together in the program you see up on the screen called Let's Take Care of the Planet, that at the same time is part of an international network, which is called the International Conference of uh, the Youth, Let's Look After the Planet, which is called the CONFI, and which I will be mentioning later on. So I've given you uh, plenty of information about the very Oh, many networks. But what is a network all about? Well, it is a network of networks um, where um, different um, public administrations participate and also schools that work to develop the skills concerning sustainability of students. It was created back in 2011. And since then, we've been working together very hard uh, towards sustainability. We've got, in fact, four main objectives. The first one is to foster um, the exchange and p partnership and dissemination of different uh, networks, resources, material, ideas, etc. We also try and solve uh, issues, share ideas, etc., etc. Our second goal stems from the first one. This goal is about promoting reflection, assessment, and innovation concerning our own practices in order to collectively build uh, reference models where we can look at. So these two objectives lead to the third one, which may be the key objective of our project, which is to develop common projects that are shared by the different networks and that are aimed at two things. On the one hand, improving the skills of students concerning sustainability, and secondly, improving the professional uh, skills of the teachers concerning sustainability as well, of course. Our fourth and last goal is to establish um, contact and relationships and common projects with other international uh, school networks. So, How do we um, develop these objectives? Well, by means of a number of different actions. The first one being a seminar. We uh, organize, that is a meeting point developed at the National Center for Environmental Education of the Spanish state, which is like the Basque in Guruguela, but at a national Spanish level. This seminar is aimed at the technical experts uh, from the networks. So this is the engine, the driving force of everything uh, that SNREF develops. Some networks uh, were already in touch with each other, but this started uh, back in 27, uh, sorry, 2010. One of the actions we carry out is aimed at improving uh, teacher skills. And it, this is a symposium for teachers that are members of SNREV. This is held in early July for two or three days. And we um, tell them, OK, you need to show us a success story uh, because everyone wants to learn from uh, the others, of course, but they need to contribute with an experience they're developing at their school. So this is a very interesting uh, space to exchange success stories. And here you see on the picture someone telling the, uh, 
the others, what they do at school. And so we also have trainers uh, that are uh, referenced in, in the field of environmental uh, education. We've had Luis and Yayo, who's going to be addressing you this afternoon. So that we encourage them to develop common joint processes and pro, uh, projects. This uh, has been up and running since 2015. And this is a bit like the Big Brother. It's uh, very short, very, very intense, and then everything um, gets bigger and bigger. And uh, we have a, a fantastic uh, atmosphere among us. Another action we implement is what we call the Essendred Action on the 5th of June. That is the uh, uh, Day of the Environment. And this is a common action uh, to inform about what's being done at the time, like concerning climate change, um, SDGs, etc. For instance, um, we made the most of the fact that the Chilean COP was held in Madrid to talk about a vaccine uh, to change the world um, in this time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this is the jewel of the Crown, the International Conference of, of uh, the youth, uh, let's look after the planet, the confint. This is a place where um, people talk about uh, different topics that have to do with uh, the eco-social field and where there is some responsibility. Uh, this is all carried out at a school level. I mean, um, a school transforms itself uh, into something else for one day in order to hold uh, a conference uh, where all students participate and where they uh, carry out the organizational work. And they base themselves on two premises. What are the responsibilities they're going to be assuming? When I talk about responsibilities, no, I'm not talking about um, guilt or blame, of course. And this is something that uh, we hear from politicians quite often. Uh, responsibility here means um, that we need to react or give answers to a problem, an issue we need to face. This is what we do at a school level and uh, in the different uh, autonomous communities. We've got representatives from the different schools that are elected and then uh, we have uh, increasing levels uh, where the representatives attend. The, the national conference is was held only yesterday. And uh, at the end of the conference, uh, there is a demand that is submitted to decision-making bodies. The main axis uh, or the idea here is that a young person represents other young people and then uh, young people elect their representatives. So this is a way of helping them organize themselves and develop an individual and collective uh, responsibility that uh, pushes them to act locally and globally before this eco-social crisis. Um, so the whole process is based on Pablo Freire's theories which is a reference for us. We, this um, movement started in uh, Brazil and it's something we loved and we are trying to implement here. We've uh, um, made some miracles. If you see what's behind all this, you will realize that it's a very fragile organization. And when you see that we've been able to um, hold five international conferences in Spain, well, it's wonderful. The first one was held in 2012 in Vitoria Gasteiz and then Barcelona, Logroño, Alcaraz and uh, Guadarrama. That ended uh, only yesterday, as I said. We've also been able to organize three more conferences at a European level, two times in Brussels where the Committee of Regions uh, received us and once in Lisbon uh, at the Portuguese uh, Parliament. Well, and uh, all these actions, all uh, these objectives, uh, why? Well, what for? Luis has mentioned this slightly, and I think we should stop here and uh, think about this, and then I will tell you more about our network. On April the 12th, 1961, 
Yuri Gagarin got up on the Vostok 1 spaceship and waited for the countdown to end. And as hours later, he whispered to the control tower one of the most beautiful and most obvious sentences uh, in history. The Earth is blue. It's wonderful. It's incredible. Two years ago, almost 60 years later, Sunita Williams, who is the woman that has stayed the longest uh, at the International Space uh, Station, she said, you look down to planet Earth and it's hard to, um, to imagine two people quarreling with each other because everything seems to be just one whole thing. We live in those wonderful continents all together. But as we come closer and closer to the Earth, things change and the blue turns into gray, black, brown. We see other pictures that don't show that, that wonderful face of our Earth. There's pollution in the air, in water. There are extreme environmental events. There's loss of biodiversity. There's a huge consumption that uh, is based on uh, the uh, depletion of uh, natural uh, resources. There's an exponential growth of waste that is generated due to this consumerism. We also see images uh, of uh, like the one of that baby that was climbing a fence or that one that uh, turned up death on a beach. Do you remember that? Well, thousands of bodies abandoned in the Mediterranean Sea or people queuing, queuing, queuing up um, to enter the US at the border or images like uh, last week's uh, a group of people demonstrating against homosexuals in Madrid. Three years ago, we were told that half of the global wealth is in the hands of just not 0.7% of the uh, world population, not even 1%, imagine that, not 0.7% of the people have half of the uh, global wealth. Well, this is showing us that we are undergoing a very deep ecological and social crisis. A very deep crisis that is summarized by this quote by Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the UN. It's not me saying this, right? Uh, not a, a radical ecologist uh, or environmentalist saying this, right? This is Secretary General of the UN in 2009 in Denmark. Our food is stuck on the accelerator and we're heading straight to the of the cliff. Human activity indicators concerning uh, water, land use uh, and the increase in transport, the increase in tourism, the increase of industrial activity, etc, etc. All this has a direct consequence and impact on ecosystemic indicators. We've got more and more CO2 in our atmosphere, we've got more and more um, nitrous oxide, we've got more and more acidified uh, water. We've lost uh, uh, soil for agriculture, etc., etc. So all these indicators are pointing to the fact that uh, we have overcome the uh, oil peak by far. The social system we have that is based on fossil fuels needs to change. There's no alternative, but this is not because we want to be greener, because it's because we, we're running out of oil. You may have read uh, on the newspapers that oil prices, lead prices, uh, sorry, uh, coal prices, gas, electricity prices are increasing endlessly. We're running out of minerals that are commonly used with, uh, we are past their peak. So we need to think uh, about using something else. I mean, uh, two weeks ago, there was the Mercedes plant in Vitoria that uh, had to uh, stop working because it didn't have any semiconductors. Those very necessary chips that are uh, that we're running out of that use rare earths. 
And due to pandemic, production has stopped and China is uh, controlling semiconductor production. And this is something we're going to be seeing more and more. I, I don't really know if we're coming to a, a collapse of the system, but I believe that we cannot keep growing materially. And we also have social development indicators uh, that led to the creation of SDGs. If we look at SDGs, we see that we're talking about poverty, hunger, inequality, inequality between people, between countries, uh, sorry, among countries, individuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what is happening? Well, we have moved to a new ecologic era. The academia accepts that we are move, we're now in the Anthropoc Anthropocene. That would be the first ecological period determined by the remains of the impact of human industrial activity that are already in the different strata. Uh, since the 50s and we see evidence of an increase of uh, CO2 in the air, uh, nuclear waste, uh, heavy industry waste, uh, aluminium, um, plastics, microplastics are present in the strata and also chicken bones, but that's a different kettle of fish. This is why some people, well, I, I say this because this is the mo most uh, used product. Today there are in the world 200 chicken for each human being on earth. And this is why some people call this the chicken zine <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of anthropocene. Some other people call it uh, equity scene because, um, well, you know why. So we need to change this um, and um, changes need to be radical and have an eco-social um, approach. Let me mention here three possible um, fields of action. One, we need to overcome linearity, this cause-effect way of reasoning. Sometimes things are simple but uh, there's complexity behind them. We need a holistic uh, approach, a systemic and multidisciplinary approach, and not the one we're having now, that's uh, one that concentrates on different uh, subjects. We also need to overcome the values that we have in this material society, in this consumer-based uh, society that's so uh, based on competitiveness and uh, having more and more and more every day. We need to work more on post-material values like sharing, like looking after others, like uh, working together, think about social um, benefits. This is something that will make us better. And thirdly, well, this is an approach uh, aimed at solving these eco-social issues, but it's also focused on um, achieving happiness. And this is why we need to develop other values, because the idea is for us to be happier at the end of the day. So a, an eco-social civilization, according to Salonen, would be the one that is one that is based on human growth, but not on economical growth, of course, which is something that uh, is recurrent. Um, and it's also based on learning about a balance that need to be uh, found between three elements, freedom, responsibility and sufficiency. because our planet has its limitations. And this is why we need to come up with uh, an eco-citizenship. Lucy Sauvet says that this is a way of relating to the world, concentrating on living here together. That's all we've got. We need to live here together. As individuals with uh, the other living beings and the other elements in our biosphere. So we need to find a way to 
live this way together in a balanced relationship, uh, including uh, collective accountability concerning the life systems we are part of, although we sometimes believe we do not participate in these systems. And uh, we need skills to uh, efficiently develop new uh, policies, new decision-making processes, and we need to be part of that. We need to be there. And this is what we try to do, as I will tell you later on. And uh, for that, what are we doing? Well, we're placing life at the core of all our school activities. This should be... Um, it should go without saying, really. For instance, some weeks ago, someone cut uh, the taxes applied to uh, the electricity consumption and increased taxes applied to the uh, producing energy producing companies. And someone felt uh, badly treated and said, well, we're going to stop all renewable energy projects. So if that decision had been made uh, placing life at the core, maybe it would have been made in a different way. Because if uh, we had had into consideration the amount of people that uh, suffer from energy poverty and that um, cannot make ends meet and that don't have a decent life, then maybe the decision would have been made differently. Um, and there are other people affected. I mean, uh, if uh, um, the whole system stops, then there will be companies that will uh, have uh, to lay off uh, their workers and then we'll be having unemployment uh, in our society and more problems in the families. So if we place life at the core when it comes to decision making, things will be made differently. And here we have two elements that have been mentioned by uh, Luis previously. Uh, we Human beings are radically interdependent and eco-dependent. We are interdependent because ever since we're born, we need other people to be able to live and develop ourselves. And the same thing goes when we're ill, when we get older and we are dependent. We are radically eco-dependent as well because everything we need for life comes from nature. We need to... Um, to eat, we need to drink, we are nature. And if we are aware of this fact, we'll be able to carry out our educational task better. And this task is very much closely related to human rights. There's not much literature concerning how to link environmental education and human rights. But I, uh, in the next three slides, I've uh, looked at uh, Gil Perez and uh, Vilches's work that uh, do work on this. This is not something I'm making up, right? Uh, they know much more than I do about this. And they have this uh, very interesting idea they say that there are first generation rights, democratic, civil, political rights that obviously are a, a sine qua non condition for everything we're going to be doing in terms of eco-citizenship development. We need to have this democratic capability to, to participate in our society. And then we have the second generation rights, right? They are economic rights, social, cultural rights, uh, concerning health, uh, food, uh, jobs, housing, etc., etc. They are absolutely necessary for the integral development of uh, individuals, but they're not enough to do away with the eco social crisis we are facing. And this is why we have the third generation uh, rights, environmental rights based on solidarity, the right to a healthy environment, the right to peace and sustainability for all people and for the coming generations. And of course, this third generation of rights needs the previous 
two generations of rights. So the environmental damage is going to be fundamental in our survival. And this is going to be true anywhere on the planet. And we see this with climate change, as we heard before. The dramatic situations which will happen, which are happening now. As we do have our first climate refugees, they've been generated. And then the right to peace for the different conflicts and wars which are raging at the moment on planet Earth. They prevent... Uh, they, they prevent people from de fully developing. They generate a lot of victims, a lot of refugees, and uh, many uh, environmental crises as well. And also, there's another development of uh, the right of the rights to everybody in terms of sustainability. In fact, achieving sustainability is the only thing that's going to actually put an end to the current crisis. Uh, we need to, uh, I don't know, if we talk about uh, the crisis of resources, perhaps we should talk about the crisis of uh, common goods, because resources always sound like they belong to somebody. So, hang on, I've just got my slides muddled up, I'm afraid. Well, we have uh, eco-social education, which would be uh, a, a, a why, a, a means. Uh, it's a process, uh, and it, it involves a new way of looking at the world, a way of looking at the world that doesn't put humans at the centre, a new view, a new eco-social view, in which uh, the ecological, uh, social issues are all interdependent and people can develop their aptitudes within the limits of their eco-citizenship. Uh, adjusting their activities to the principles of eco-dependence and interdependence and looking after the links we have with other human beings and other living beings and adding all of this to the ultimate aim of education, which is to be happy. Because what is the ultimate aim of education? Well, going back to Paulo Freire, uh, he said it is to be happy. And in this sense, let's have a look now at some of the actions that we uh, carry out and that uh, are, are related to everything that I've said so far. We're talking about education based on ethics, eco-social ethics. So we've carried out, uh, we've basically grouped them uh, in accordance with their ethical charge, if you like. You can move them around the different categories as you can discuss which category they should be in, but I mean, that's the general idea. The first group would be uh, adaptation actions. When we talk about climate change, we talk about mitigation and adaptation. And in relation to adaptation, these would be more moral than ethic decisions, which are related to uh, how we use water, uh, light, uh, the use of uh, printers and paper, etc. It would be the creation of uh, management protocols, uh, waste separation, the communication of the environmental benefits, for example etc. And then we have mitigation actions. These are political proposals, uh, political with a capital P, uh, because they're talking about public issues and public goods, not uh, uh, about political parties. We're not talking about partisan politics. We're talking about politics in the broader sense of the term. And here we can talk about improving energy efficiency, school mobility, uh, how we can regenerate the play areas, the playgrounds. Uh, we have uh, markets based on solidarity, healthy food, the cleanliness of the ecosystems, uh, planting local uh, flora, etc. And then at a third level, we have transition actions. And these are responses to the eco-social crisis uh, linked to the depletion of fossil fuels 
And there, uh, the children or the children or the students uh, develop proposals for responsible consumption, local consumption, cooperation, cultural and linguistic diversity, biodiversity, uh, food sovereignty, people-based economy, uh, gender equality, uh, counter advertising exercises, and also Marchena school. Um, sorry, Marchena um, soap. So they collect up uh, different waste products and they make soap with it. That's what they do in one of the schools. Uh, they go through different processes to make this soap and then they distribute the soap. So they provide the soap to different uh, the schools themselves and also school communities. And then anything that's left over, they send to uh, different African countries, different countries. Uh, for example, in Togo, there's one of the countries they send it to, and sometimes they go to you go to the uh, the medical centre in Togo, and uh, the soap that is made at this school is the only antiseptic they have. So we're talking about very simple actions. They're very simple. They're not particularly ambitious, but uh, you can imagine just imagine the impact that it can have sometimes. And there are a number of different uh, examples of this kind have international campaigns uh, against the use of palm oil, against climate change, uh, supporting and disseminating the work of female scientists, for example. And here we work with International Animal Rescue, Homeward Bound, Mother Nature Needs Her Daughters, etc. And then the next set of actions are perhaps the most deep-rooted ones, and they are uh, eco-social actions that actually produce real changes in the eco-social structures and contribute to improving the conditions in which the community lives with proce political processes of empowerment and with specific actions which have been adapted to the capacities of students, of course. I mean, we're talking about, uh, we, we give them a, a very adult names when we're talking about these actions, but they're always age appropriate, of course. Uh, we talk about eco-social, they, they come to an, a, a sign an eco-social pact, uh, aim to recover the cities. Uh, they participate in environmental and social territorial planning, governance, democratic budgets and participatory budgets. They collect school material and they send them to developing countries, especially to the Sahara region. Uh, they work uh, on human rights and to make sure that everyone, uh, everyone's dignity is preserved and many other things besides. Now, they can't be here to tell you what they do, but I'm just going to show you some photos of uh, some of the things that they do. I'm not going to sort of talk about it too much. I'm just going to show you some photos of the children in action. Cosas que se hacen en los distintos centros de... Sometimes they're micro projects, just micro projects. Sustainable cities. We have a lot of intergenerational experiences. This is the Marchena Soap project. Here, the children have taken over two parking spaces in the city to make a sort of garden, school mobility, uh, Help Charlie is another great project uh, in the, the dunes in, in western, eastern Spain, the eastern coast of Spain. And they're sending, they're sending messages to the COP21. Uh, here we have a, a project on uh, female scientists and the environment. This is Carmele Llano. She's a girl from, a woman from Bilbao who uh, heads up the Animal Rescue Centre in Borneo to try to help the orangutans. 
uh, who are becoming extinct due to the use of palm oil. This is Ushua Lopez, Ushua Lopez, sorry. And in 2018, she uh, they she helped us to be involved in the Homeward Bound project. I think there are 80 women who go around the Antarctic in a boat. I don't know if it's for two months or three months looking and then seeing the different work that is being carried out in the different stations. And she came to talk about that uh, to the children, talking about uh, what female scientists do. Uh, here they're comparing what their school is like with what other schools are like. This is a, a, a market. This is uh, working with the Catalonian network during a COVID-19 crisis. And here we can see teachers talking to other teachers, sharing experiences. Here we go off to the nearby woods whenever we get the chance. Now this is a school meeting. Here we break out of the, uh, the timetable box. You get students of all different ages who get together to talk and discuss things. And this is the same thing, eh, but in Albacete. This is uh, one in the in the autonomous region. This is uh, held in Urdaibai. This is the same one in Valencia. And here we have uh, in Rioja the same thing, in Alcaraz, in Albacete. So these assemblies that we hold, we hold they're held all over. Here are some of our girls there in the Council of the Regions in Brussels. They're there waiting for the uh, Euro, the E, the Euro. The politicians to come out. And here you can see uh, there are hummingbirds, which is our symbol. There we go. I was going to tell you a story, but I don't have time to. But there you can see. This was I'll just end by saying that the network was formed because some of us had a dream and we said, it's time to stop dreaming. It's time to start making history. And so that's what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Jose Manuel, we're now going to have time for some questions. Does anybody have any questions for Jose Manuel Gutierrez Bastida? Can I just say something else? Yeah, if you want to tell us a story, you're very welcome to as well. Okay, let, uh, well, maybe later. I said before, I said yesterday that the, the confint or the assembly in Guadarrama finished yesterday. And in fact, they, a group of young people from Seville went to the first urban forum. And there's going to be a group of young people who are going to present the manifesto that they have written to the authorities, the people that have decision making power in this particular airfield. Uh, it's very, very long, but I'm now going to read the last paragraph. We'll do our best, but we don't have it. We are sick of not being listened to. We're sick of not being taken seriously. We're sick of everyone saying that the young people are the future, but using that as an excuse not to bring about any change. Young people, we believe in a future in which there are no plastics in the sea, that there are no inequalities. We believe in a future in which... Uh, the masses are not moved by labels, but rather by responsible actions. We want a better future, but we want it for everyone. And we want it uh, with collab and with your collaboration and with your help. Uh, this future can start today, because if it's not today, then when? If it's not us, then who? Oh, I think around they, they deserve a round of applause, the people who wrote that manifesto. <laughs> I think they're always uh, able to surprise us and they'll continue to surprise us. You just need to live, live, give them the space they need and the opportunity they need. And they come up with wonderful things just like that manifesto. I totally agree. Right. Well, so with the Confint Assembly in Guadarrama, now it's the first Confint, this first assembly that you've held after the end of the pandem pandemic. And I'm sure you had a specific 
experience of the pandemic. We all have our own experiences of the pandemic. But they're working on the basis or what they're motivated by by anger, which is always better than sadness because that leads to passivity. So um, have they sort of, you know, accepted the fact that they can't do anything or are they, you know, have they come out fighting? Oh yeah, no, they've got, they're very enthusiastic. They're a bit in shock still, I think. And then we also don't know what the mid and long term effects are going to be on the development, the psychological development of young people. I mean, we're talking about children at the age of three, four, five, six. I mean, they've spent, you know, a year and a half of their lives seeing people's faces covered by masks. And don't go near that person and don't touch that person and stay away and keep your distance. I mean, these are these really have an impact on them. So we don't really know what the medium and long term effects are going to be in that sense. But those who are slightly older, I think it's really helped them. It's been almost a trigger for them. It's prompted them to think about things. It's made them realize a lot of things. And I think for many, in many cases, it's been sort of the, the push they needed to get involved and to go out onto the street on the 27th of September. No, it was the Friday beforehand, I think. I can't remember. Anyway, we've seen uh, people, young people going out onto the street, uh, protesting against this inaction uh, in the face of climate change. I mean, this is fantastic. And this has been an element that, uh, well, the pandemic, I think, is actually, sadly, uh, and the fact that we're, we're so passive uh, against climate change. This is going to, I think, encourage young people to be more active themselves. Now, do you work on the spaces? Do you focus on the spaces? I mean, we're talking about uh, playgrounds. Uh, it's incredibly unequal right I mean let's have a look football I mean basically playgrounds are just a, take, a, taken over by football matches that are played mainly by boys uh, which is a reflection of the patriarchal society right do you work on that right if we work if we use the word environment there's no definition of environment that says it's nature and only nature if you look at any definition of environment it always says that which surrounds us the natural spaces and the artificial spaces, that which surrounds us. So environmental education is always focused on nature and environment understood as nature. But perhaps this is why we focus more on the eco-social side of things. There's no doubt now we, we engage in eco-social education for ecological crises and the eco-social crises as well. And when we're talking about the social side of things, we do, of course we look at the different how different spaces in schools are used and we work on that. And in fact, there's, there's a word that Luis uh, has mentioned more and that's democracy. We work democratically. When we work with teachers and the teachers often say, we don't know how to do it. We want to do it, but we don't. For example, in the playground, how can we change the way space is used in the playground? And I always say, look, the easiest way is to just get everyone sitting around a table and talk about it. And solutions just come up and it's true. It happens every single time. But often we don't dare, we're reluctant to cede our power to other people because, you know, if I'm uh, the teacher, I have a certain degree of power and it's difficult to give up that power. So we work with teachers as well to, to work on that ability. But we need to leave them. We need to get students and give them the opportunity to, to sort of spread their wings. Um, there's wonderful uh, examples in which they've taken these football pitches, uh, basketball pitches, and they've, they've made different areas for people to sit down or to play different types of games. And they've got different areas for rhythmic gymnastics or for dance, for example. There's some fantastic experience. And always, uh, for, this is the student's own initiative, as if they're given the opportunity to think about it. Now, it's true uh, that as adults, we feel that... Uh, we don't have enough space to decide. We feel that, but then we actually do exactly the same thing with the future generations. 
I think we've got a lot more in common than we often think. Are there any questions? If not, just to close, we're talking about teachers, we're talking about young people, but what about teachers? And, and what, how do teachers react to all of these, uh, these, uh, these initiatives? What is it? Is it like a breath of fresh air for them or are they reluctant to engage? Well, I think that's the most difficult question to answer. Teachers, how do they relax? There are 65 schools involved in our agenda. And that means that there is a huge number of teachers uh, who agree that something new is required. Our slogan is change the methodology to change the world. And that's what we try to do. Teachers really encounter many problems in their daily work and it's a scales, right? And sometimes it tips one way and sometimes it tips another way and that will depend and, and that will determine whether their response is positive or negative. Uh, teachers have a very intense curriculum, that they have, a lot of things they have to teach, limited timetable, a lot of organizational constraints. We have a lot of difficulty uh, finding time to meet, to find an hour to do something together. It's difficult their organizational functional difficulties and their, their huge difficulties. But on the other hand, there is a, a groundswell of teachers who really want to do something different and who really enjoy being with children, with their students and, and enjoy seeing their students become involved. Uh, we have our representatives, the, the class reps who are students and then uh, the teachers always say that they really enjoy the, their sessions with the class reps. And they always feel really, really proud of what they're doing. So I think it depends on the individual situation of the school, of the teachers themselves. But uh, I think there is a lot of eagerness. There's a lack of training. And uh, training has focused on uh, language acquisition, like foreign language and technological skills. That's all, uh, because you've got a new application coming every single day. You no, no longer have a chalk blackboard. You've got all sorts of different uh, applications. and You just learn to use one and then another one comes along. And so I think the training has really overlooked other types of training, which are more focused on the social side of things. And that's a shame. I think that's something that uh, we a challenge we need to rise to in the future. Yes, I think that's a very useful thing to note. There is. A question that's come over, come through the YouTube channel. Is there a public education, is there any public education project in the Basque country which actually uh, actually takes on and uses this eco-social curriculum or are we still waiting for that to happen? Yes, we're still waiting for that to happen. It hasn't been adopted by any educational authority in the Basque country. In the 2030 school agenda, well, that 2030 uh, school agenda is completely impregnated with eco-social elements. So hopefully uh, it will be adopted in the future because it's just it's a program. It's a study plan. And then each school decides what its own syllabus is going to be uh, and decides the degree to which it's actually going to take on what we're suggesting. But uh, from the public authorities, uh, sort of they haven't uh, the, the Basque education system hasn't adopted an eco-social curriculum to date uh, the new law on education new education act does make certain headway in this area but it's not enough and then we have the, well, the, in the new education act that's being that's being developed here uh, in the Basque Country is going to be limited uh, by the uh, the statewide education act that's been developed in Madrid. But am I hopeful? Well, you know, you never quite lose hope. Thank you very much.